Uh, I'm going to start now with my four minutes on what I see as the things that excite me, the opportunities, and what I see as the challenges. I think actually what I'm going to do to keep it rigorous, I might ask you to make notes. I think we do Q&As at the end so I can make sure that each of the speakers gets a shot of it and then we'll come back. So I'm going to make notes of my questions and then open it up to the floor. Um, in terms of opportunities, I have one word, it's capsid. Uh, so we've now seen the fact that if you can take a shell of a protein, in this, in this instance the foot and mouth disease virus, if you just take the protein shell without any of the active viral ingredients, you can create a full immunological response. And so uh, Diamond, which is this accelerator at Harwell, uh, has uniquely a viral containment unit where you can use <coughs> the X-ray crystallography to look at the atomic shape of the virus. That's been done. Using in silico biology, a protein shell has been expressed in, insect, uh, in an insect uh, uh, expression system and has demonstrated full protection <coughs> in a foot and mouth challenge at Purbright. Now, what actually interests me more than anything else is that without the diamond facility at Harwell, without the in silico biology skills, <coughs> without the foot and mouth challenge at Purbright, we wouldn't have been able to see this. There are very few places in the world where, in one nation, this work could have come together. And why am I excited? It, the, the, the expressed capsid shows longer stability, longer immunology, and so in the UK, if we have an outbreak, we can immunize immediately. We don't have to worry about infecting the beast with a virus, so you won't be able to export it to, uh, to uh, uh, Argentina, if they still accept our imports, because you can demonstrate that you don't have a virus in the system. You can show that they're foot and mouth disease free. So we're no longer going to have a picture of three and a half million cattle, one hopes, on the United Kingdom uh, agricultural land. But more importantly, we can take that technology very probably into the 10 subtypes of foot and mouth disease. In the southern hemisphere, foot and mouth disease is endemic. And so your milk production and your meat conversion on your animal stock is much lower yield than it should be. You need typically, if you're going to immunize, to do two immunizations a year. It looks like we should be able to do one immunization a year. The economies then of rounding up all your Kenyan ca cattle and immunizing once a year looks like it will be successful. So with this technology, number one, we should be able to up the protein and milk production that the globe is capable of. Secondly, there's no reason to think that we won't be able to move it into polio where there's resistance to the uh, attenuated vaccine that has been used for years. And thirdly, how interesting it would be if we could get hold of flu. So as we live on the precipice of the zoonotic precipice of jumping from bird or pig into man, if we can actually find the cross-reactivity or cross-protectivity that we can get with a capsid, that would be a dream. The second area that I'm uh, very excited about continues to be the progress of stratified medicine. And really because the cost of sequencing has now got to the stage where using models like cancer, we can take sequencing into rare genetic disease. And my hunch is that rare genetic disease will probably account for 20 to 30% of known diseases. So as we learn to stratify disease genetically, then we can start to move on stratified medicine and the affordability of getting that genetic understanding so we can look at defined cohorts which are genetically similar uh, is now the great possibility. On challenges, as, as innovation becomes increasingly interdisciplinary, it becomes harder and harder for one company to have all of the top-level skills across engineering, biology, IT, mathematics. And so I think universities have a unique place now. Not only, I mean, in the past it was about biology. In the future, I think it's about integrating <coughs> the functional excellence they have for that research concept that can really be the innovative concept that takes us forward. 
So for me, I'm terribly concerned to see the universities understand they have a key role as a knowledge hub. And as a knowledge hub, I want them to understand which way they're going. Are they doing this for royalty reward or for economic impact? I recently went to MIT and found their rules clearly described that they were there for economic impact. And I was delighted to walk through the research labs with venture capitalists who said to me, it's very easy to work with our colleagues here because they're after impact. It isn't a lengthy negotiation on this unique intellectual property that they have been, that's been developed by the university. And it takes three years to get an agreement before we get uh, off uh, on the chase. The last challenge I have, and again, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, I've referred to it earlier, it's changing the culture. It's getting the culture that exists in a Boston or in a San Diego where the academic feels happy to go and see the entrepreneur and the venture capitalist, and they work as a threesome. And they bring it through. They bring through that innovation. So it's creating that culture of trust. So in the first instance, I say, let's make sure the universities know what they're about, and we're all clear about it. My hope is that government will say economic impact. And that will have an impact on the transparency we can achieve with the Knowledge Hub. The second thing is we've got to drive that culture. It goes back to my starting statement. Let's get used to working with each other. Let's be surprised by the respective skills we have and the trust that can be created between us and the excitement of innovation. Innovation is very difficult. I've done it, uh, luckily, for most of my life. Uh, it's, it, you need so many skills to actually get there. And you finally get registered. And then you find, I've only got the United Kingdom, and I've got to get a global market. How do I get to that? It's a long game. It's a tough game. It needs great partnerships and trust to get it there. So I've been at the MRC for two and a half years, but prior to that I spent 29 years in the NHS, six years as chair of NHS Lothian's Service Redesign Committee, and two and a half years as steward of the NHS R&D system in Scotland. 5.3 million people, 10 billion spend a year. The Government-funded research base in the UK is roughly five billion, uh, to which we had another about, about another billion of charity spend, nearly all in medicine. So in life sciences, about 60% of that uh, it comprises about 60% of that publicly funded research base in the UK. In terms of productivity per dollar, it has no rival in the OECD countries. 3% of the world's GDP, 4% of the world's scientists, 14% of the highly cited papers, 20% of papers cited more than a thousand times. So the UK is enormously productive of new ideas. Now I've got two opportunities and I'm going to match each of them with a challenge. One is from clinical science, one is from basic science. In clinical science, building on what uh, Bill said, I think there's a tremendous opportunity in molecular diagnostics for stratified medicine. And that's much more than just sequencing DNA. That's near patient devices, it's epigenetics, it's molecular imaging, it's in four dimensions. And the challenge is obviously procurement in the NHS, driven by high volume, low cost, very difficult for innovative companies to get in. The second opportunity is a basic science opportunity. It draws on the work at the Laboratory of Molecular Biology by Jason Chin and others. It's to do with synthetic biology. Uh, the guys at LMB have synthesized entirely novel nucleic acids, which interact with RNA and DNA, but are resistant to RNAs and DNAs. And therefore, they offer tremendous therapeutic potential. Could you take your antisense in a tablet uh, 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 and I think that there's a tremendous potential new approach to drug therapy based on XNA. Uh, and obviously the challenge, particularly in the UK, is accessing venture capital. Now the government has done its bit by funding TSB to partner MRC in the biomedical catalyst, a lot of catalysts around, um, but that seems to have been very successful but again, there's a general concern in the discovery science translation end of academia in the UK that there isn't enough 
venture capital close by. So the two opportunities, molecular diagnostics for stratified medicine and uh, synthetic biology, particularly novel nucleic acids, and the two challenges, NHS procurement, venture capital. A little context on uh, GE Healthcare. We're a $19 billion global healthcare player concentrating in traditional diagnostics uh, equipment, as you'd say, radiology-based equipment, molecular diagnostics, healthcare IT, and life sciences. So we play in every market and, and with a number of technologies, but principally on the diagnostic side. And I'm going to give you a real-life challenge that, that we face today, and, and that is the integration of IT, diagnostics, and therapies, the clinical, the clinical integration of those technologies. You know, we've been in the diagnostics world since the invention of X-ray for over 100 years. And we've had the luxury of, of really making Swiss Army knives. We could make diagnostics that physicians could use to diagnose a variety of diseases and to apply a number of different therapies over the years as that evolved into CT, MRI, PET imaging. And we didn't really have to think about the integration with the therapies or with, um, with uh, drugs. We let the physicians do that. We let the physicians be the integrators. And today we're working with much more precise diagnostics. A good example would be flutometanol, which is an amyloid binding PET agent that we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in. But in today's world of diagnostics, we can't just release that in the market and expect that to be a screening tool to be used across a broad population. This is a tool that has to be integrated. It has to be integrated with molecular tracers that help find the high-risk populations. It has to be integrated with the therapy. We also have IT systems that allow for the quantification of the plaque load via the tracer. We have to design those to work uniquely with a therapeutic agent so that we can demonstrate through the biomarkers that the formation of the plaque has been arrested. So as we spend hundreds of millions of dollars to bring a diagnostic to market, we find ourselves in a completely different world than the one that we grew up in, one where we have to work with people that are developing novel serum-based tracers, people that are developing pharmaceutical companies that are developing products like BAPI. And we have to work with them not in front of the clinician, but well upstream, you know, as the products are being developed, as the therapies are being developed, we have to go through trials together, early trials together. We have to work on reimbursement together. We have to work on business models together to understand, you know, how do you make money as a, the diagnostic player? How do you make money as a therapeutic player? This is a, an unnatural act, I can tell you, because even within our business, even within the walls of, of GE Healthcare, getting the IT side and the molecular side and the traditional radiology side to work together is, is a real thrust. Now I go outside the boundaries of my own business and uh, I've got uh, uh, an even bigger challenge because the, the, our, you know, our folks from the pharma side and the biopharmaceutical side are working on exactly the same thing. Now there's, you know, I've, I, I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the rules a little bit because the problem and the opportunity are the same thing, the same yeah. example. And, and there are, I've got countless examples of this in our business, but it's something that we've got to work very hard to solve because the opportunity is essentially precision medicine. By itself, our novel tracer is, is, is not going to accomplish anything. And I, I, I believe that by themselves, some of these drugs, these, 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 the pipeline of 40 pharmaceuticals right now in the pipeline for Alzheimer's are not going to be able to work by themselves. So we've got to find ways to break down the barriers and work together. Okay, so uh, a little bit context also on J&J and j, &J innovation. Um, we clearly recognize uh, that most of the innovation uh, is not really starting within the uh, confines uh, of j, j in our research labs, and probably 80% or more of the innovation uh, starts with uh, collaborations with academia and venture capital and entrepreneurs. So uh, what we have done is to, to come, uh, as Bill is saying, 
to those areas where there is a lot of uh, innovation going on, uh, like uh, the UK, um, to be close to the entrepreneurs, to be close to the academic centers. Uh, we picked uh, the UK because of its high concentration of great academic research, um, support of government, uh, great clinical uh, institutions, uh, worldwide known institutions like NICE, uh, but also smart uh, capital and good entrepreneurs, and especially already a very intense network uh, of collaborations between the various uh, academic and clinical groups. Um, and of course, the economic stress helped a little bit in creating that collaboration, but it's still it's uh, a great start to be here. Uh, build on that, I think the major opportunity we see is uh, a more open uh, and interactive exchange uh, of science and knowledge and expertise between basic scientists, clinicians uh, at the various academic and clinical uh, groups, but also with industry. Um, innovation rarely happens in one lab. Uh, most of the times it happens uh, as a result of a close collaboration between scientists, physicians in different places. Innovation happens when ideas are promiscuous. So we need to be able to uh, stimulate uh, that interaction. I think it would definitely speed up um, the process of establishing clinical trials uh, by ensuring that the relevant issues are being considered. It would also enable us to uh, discover potential safety issues earlier uh, in the process. Could also encourage a collaboration between very diverse groups uh, of scientists to come up with new uh, and conversion technologies. Um, I've seen a couple of very good initiatives. Uh, uh, one of them uh, started in, in, in California, the uh, Disease Team Research Awards, uh, which were funded by the uh, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, MRC was part of that, so it, it basically encouraged scientists um, to build teams uh, with the best people in the world, uh, coming from academia, coming from clinics, uh, coming from the industry, and form a team uh, to really work on regenerative medicine. Uh, program was started in, in 2010. Uh, already uh, the first team is working with the FDA uh, to look for their first clinical trials. I think another major opportunity is really an opportunity that was already mentioned here is uh, given the, the vast knowledge we have now in different molecular and inflammatory processes, um, that's provided us the opportunity to come up with better techniques, whether it's imaging uh, or uh, other diagnostic tools to characterize clinical patient trial populations. And of course, you want to pick up a phase 2A, phase 2B population, which is uh, predictive of the larger phase three population, but in certain cases, we want to go to subpopulations. And particularly in, in neuroscience, as already mentioned on my left, I think there is major opportunity to better and earlier characterize uh, Alzheimer's disease populations so that we can be successful in our next iteration of, of clinical trials. Um, I think there is clear recognition already in the field like asthma that it is that there are many subtypes in asthma and. and Companies like Genentech are already looking at co-diagnostics uh, to develop their uh, IL-13. Um, so a lot of progress has been made, but I think uh, it's only the start. Uh, as to the big challenges, um, as Bill mentioned, I think with regard to the collaboration across various industry uh, uh, participants, it's uh, a cultural change of collaboration, uh, but also to overcome the fear of IP <coughs> you overcome the, the fear of contamination. We shouldn't negotiate nine months uh, to, uh, to figure out the rights. Uh, we should come up with systems where we allow researchers uh, in different uh, groups to work easier uh, and to exchange people uh, more readily uh, to uh, enable that cross-fertilization. Uh, with regard to the, the biomarkers um, and new imaging techniques, I think the biggest challenge is that science is evolving very quickly. Uh, but the regulators are uh, slow to adapt and approve those uh, new diagnostic tools. And so there is a window of opportunity lost. And I think the pharmaceutical company, together with the regulators and the diagnostic companies, really need to work together to obtain a much more quicker adaptation of those diagnostic tools uh, in the process. So if you want to invest in a technology that really is a transformational technology, 
to win, if you're a rational human being, you've got to bank on it's taking 15 to 20 years. Of course, 99% of the global venture capital in this industry is structured in 10-year funds, where the average holding period is three to six years. So that's a big problem. And when you, why 15 to 20 years? What's the evidence for that? Well, if you look at those technologies that have really made a difference, that's what it's taken. <clears throat> if you look at antibodies, that's the case. If you look at now antisense, we have the first antisense drugs approved. Gene therapies, we have the first gene therapy drugs approved. Oncolytic viruses, almost every really transformational technology, including personalized medicine, I think. Bill's been working on that maybe for 30 years, I don't know. But it's taken, it's taken 20 years. And you know, that, is the, that is the experience uh, as an investor. And, and if I look at the opportunities, I think I'm going to give you two now, one I, at a bit different ends of that cycle. The one at the, at the late end, which has really come through the 15 years of discovery, then there's a sort of over-exuberance for a couple of years, then there's a profound disappointment, stroke depression for 10 to 12 years. <laughs> And then eventually, the technology emerges through the mist with real application in clinical, in clinical opportunities, probably narrower than where people th first thought it would be applied, but really generating benefit, is gene therapy, actually. And uh, there are now two very clear systems, uh, uh, AAV and lentiviral vectors, where many of the issues around how to make the vectors, how to sort the IP, how to deliver the right vector in the right patient at the right time with the right system in the right indications. All of those risks have really been discharged in a narrow set of applications for both lentiviral vectors and for AAV. And so we now see clinical ap applications where in patients where we see an efficacy safety trade-off that is acceptable for those patients. And I'd leave you with one thought around why that's an interesting area which is in a world where there might be 6,000 uh, genetic disorders, many of those disorders are going to require gene therapy solutions. And although what we see now is a real niche application, for example, in pediatric immunodeficiency disorders like the, the so-called bubble kids, the ADA skid kids, where GSK actually have a partnership with the San Rafael Hospital in Milan on that technology, actually, I predict that we will see those technologies spread out from those real niche pediatric indications. So that's the sort of first opportunity. <coughs> the second, which, depending on whether you're an enthusiast, which I am, you like to believe, but everyone believes it, that you're not really at the beginning of a 15-year cycle, but we might be, is really an early cancer detection. So we now know that, so that tumors throw off uh, DNA into the circulating plasma, so-called circulating tumor DNA, ctDNA. That could be measured. Um, it's quantitative. It has prognostic value. We know that now. Uh, so it can be sequenced really at very high throughput and very high coverage. Sequencing costs are coming down. That is probably going to be that will not probably that will be an important clinical modality in both early cancer detection, in prognostic management, in residual tumor management, in drug response, in resistance <laughs> emergence. There's going to be a ton of applications for that. Quite what the business models are for that, no one knows. Quite where the IP is, very difficult to know. Uh, but that technology has clinical utility, and whether we're at the beginning of that cycle, at the end of that, you know, time will tell. And really, that technology, I think, highlights the big challenge that, that we face, picking up on the points of some of the panel, which is that, you know, I, I believe that we've come to the end of a phase in healthcare where the really big prize is we're about the discovery of the next white pill. You know, if you look at what statins did for cardiovascular disease, fantastic outcome in human health. But those big prizes, particularly in those chronic diseases, are largely done now. <coughs> the really big prizes are going to be around the business of delivering healthcare. And that is going to use patient stratification tools. Again, very broad. These won't just be genomic tools. They will be very broad <coughs> tools. And the real problem of that is that changing a healthcare system, and if you take the early cancer example, let's say you could detect cancer early, but what are you going to do about it? Because healthcare systems are not set up to treat patients in whom you've got <coughs> potentially a circulating tumor DNA signal, which you know with high sensitivity and probably specificity greater than 99% means that that patient has got some cancer somewhere in them. But how are you going to find that? How's the healthcare system going to adopt that? How are you going to demonstrate the evidence? as an investor to persuade a healthcare payer 
to adopt that when the mindset of healthcare payers is that we will not fund technology for which a rigorous health economic case has been made. And I think that's the single biggest challenge, Bill. So there's sort of my two challenges combined to one. One is how do we get healthcare systems to adopt technology and actually how to do that before the fully health economic case has been made? And secondly, how as an investor do you sit here today saying, I want to build a circulating tumor DNA business knowing that it might take me 15 years. And even when I get there 15 years, it might take me another 15 years to generate the data to get someone to pay for it.